Good morning. Thank you. Let me just say quickly before we dive into this, so we've been doing this uh, uh, 100 Best Places to Work list in Fortune for 20 years now. Yes. It is our most popular list by far. It, it generates the most traffic, far more than the Fortune 500 list. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's also now the most important list. I mean, in a world where, uh, in, a, in a digital world where access to natural resources, physical capital, a strong balance sheet, access to financial re resources, those things aren't as important as number one, which is access to great talent. That's the real differentiator in business. You've been doing this for 20 years, on the list for 20 years, from the very beginning. How did you do it? To be very transparent, uh, I did not understand when I first became CEO uh, how important culture was. Uh, I thought the role of the CEO was vision and strategy for the company, develop, recruit, retain, and change the leadership team to implement that vision and strategy and communications. And within a very short time, I realized culture was really how I was enabling all those aspects. And so while some people view culture as not a key ownership requirement for the CEO, I respectfully disagree. I think it is the foundation. And we could have fun saying this culture eat strategy for breakfast. Uh, I actually think it's the combination of vision and strategy, uh, the leadership team, the culture and the communications that determines a company's survival. My competitors from when I took over as CEO are all gone, all of them. And great companies like a Nortel, Alcatel, Lucent from 10 years ago that were huge challengers and we were moving in their market are a shadow of what they were before. And if you were to say what has been the one sustaining ingredient on that, it was our foundation of culture. And what, was there an event that caused you to recognize that? Was there a, a, a mistake, a moment when you said, I've really got to pay more attention to building the culture? No, I think it just actually evolved. Uh, oddly enough, even on issues, you know, I had the honor of doing many acquisitions uh, in an industry where 90% of acquisitions fail, and if you fail too often as a CEO uh, in your acquisitions, you're, you're changed. Uh, one of the ingredients we defined as important in the acquiring company that we targeted was, was their culture similar to ours? I just learned how to articulate it more, and I constantly crowdsource, and as I travel around the world even today, uh, whether it's yesterday being, being uh, honored to be with the Chief of Staff of the Army, who's the top leader of the U.S. Army, or whether it's meeting with government leaders or startups, I now watch where culture actually plays a role in every single organization. You and I were talking about your organization. Yes. It doesn't matter if it's the U.S. military. It doesn't matter if it's a country like France. It doesn't matter if it's a Walmart or a startup. Culture plays a huge role in not just the environment and the talent, to your point, that you attract. Uh, I would argue it's what holds you in there during the tough times, and every company's going to hit tough but times. But so how do you do that? I mean, Cisco these days employs mm -hmm. how many people? 75,000 people. 75,000 people. How do you create a common culture among 75,000 people? I think it starts with the CEO, and while I'm honored to have been the CEO for 20 years, it's now Chuck's to drive. Yep. Uh, it has to, the CEO, you've got to walk the talk. Uh, in almost every session I do, whether it's on stage, whether it's at an event for Cisco or just at a uh, charity event over the weekend on a uh, Sunday night, uh, it's amazing how often you are asked about culture directly or indirectly when somebody comes up and says, I love your company because of how you treat your employees and how you helped me through a battle with cancer or how you've made a difference in our lives and we're modeling after you. They're all talking culture and the ability to do it. So it starts with the CEO really believing it, having a great HR lead, and I really don't believe in human resources, I believe in a cultural lead. Fran Katsudis is amazing, that makes a huge difference. And it's, it, it's gotta be very sincere. You've gotta walk the talk every moment. When I was with the Chief of Staff of the Army yesterday, remember he, he controls a million people. Uh, and from the time we walked into his office and we were receiving the word in the evening, uh, in terms of civilian award from the top award the Army gives to civilians, uh, he was directly or indirectly teaching culture. 
We started at the desk, and he talked about the history of the desk. He talked about the uh, 38 people that had been his predecessors. He talked about a globe over to the side about where the strategy for World War II was set out. He talked about the importance of the war fighter and the culture that this inhabited and how it was important to make this a volunteer army that America really believed in and the direction. And everything he did for eight hours was an example of walking the culture. I saw the exact same thing in France, something that several of you might have heard me talk about before two and a half years ago, when a socialist leader by the name of President Hollande, after the worst week of his life in terms of uh, political challenges that came at him, uh, I spent an hour and a half with him on a Friday evening, and he talked about culture and where he wanted to take the country and talked about digitizing the country and could a country that was probably the last place in the world that you would locate business and resources, could it truly become the best place in Europe and the number one startup country? And the change that was about vision and strategy, it was about getting the right leaders, his prime minister, his ministry of the economy in line, the defense minister, but it was really about the culture he wanted to build. Fast forward quickly, anybody want to take a guess on what was the number one startup nation in Europe this last calendar year? France. There was a 130 to 140 high-tech venture startups in France for five or six years in a row. Right after he started this program, they moved it to 226, and last year it was 486. There is no entitlement. It's amazing. Anybody want to take a guess what the U.S. numbers are doing? IPOs? The NASDAQ averages 200 to 240. Last year it was 90. This is an environment where the culture has to start at the top, in an environment where you disrupt, get disrupted, and the importance of getting comfortable with change, even though change makes everyone in this room uncomfortable. Uh, even talking about it, CEO's hands normal sweat. It's great when I talk about you changing, but not me. <laughs> how do you build that environment? So let's talk about change a little bit, because it does seem to me that, as a journalist watching these things over the last few decades, that the nature of, of jobs like yours or the head of the Army or President Hollande mm -hmm. has changed dramatically. I mean, organizations used to be sort of information hierarchies. All the information went up to the top. Yes. The people at the top decided on the strategy and what everyone had to do, and then the orders came back down the yes. line. It's not the way it works today. Things are too fast. You can't wait for people up at the top to make decisions, and information is flowing sideways, not up the hierarchy. Totally changes the, the, your job, doesn't it? It really does, and uh, if you think it's fast today, uh, it's about to go on steroids. Uh, there are about 17 billion, 17 billion devices connected to the internet today. When Cisco was founded uh, over 30 years ago, there was 1,000. There'll be 500 billion in 10 years. That means you're gonna have information coming into your company in ways you never imagined before. First, the CEO has to find a way of getting the relevant information to him at the right point in time to be able to make the right decisions. But very often, and let's talk about how you're gonna to interface to your customers. If you watch what the startups are doing today, they are not talking about come to my website and look to see what you wanna buy and then targeting you as a, a customer. They're watching what you're doing on your social media. They're watching what you do with Twitter, what you do with Facebook. They'll know that you're gonna buy running shoes for the New York Marathon before you actually know it yourself. They will contact you in a unique way. And what I'm sharing with you is this new environment of speed and innovation is only gonna go up exponentially. And at the foundation of a company or a country's success is the combination of culture, crisp vision and strategy, the leadership team, but also communications. And if you don't do that well, you'll get left behind. You could be a great CEO, and there were a number of them 10, 20 years ago, who could literally stay in the back office, do their reviews, brutal tough reviews, et cetera, not spend a lot of time communicating with their customers or their shareholders or their employees, and get good business results. Those days are gone forever. Speed of change, how you get your information, how do you create a culture that really drives it through? So for example, Cisco. 20 years ago, when I realized how important culture was, I literally put it on a badge. Make innovation happen. Just do the right thing. 
Change the way the world works, lives, learns, and plays. People said, you're a router company, John, you don't get it. I said, no, the, <laughs> inter the internet's gonna change it, and we're going to ride that horse to make it happen. Today, if you talk to Fran Casutis, you talk about really what we're really thinking about in terms of our culture. It's built around three platforms. It's about connecting everything. It's about innovation everywhere. And it's about benefiting everyone. And while those sound similar to what I said 20 years ago, the foundation is similar, but it speaks to a new speed, it speaks Different to magnitude. digitization, it speaks to the ability to transform. You know, it's funny you say that because we're, we're, we're in the field right now with our annual uh, Fortune 500 CEO survey, mm -hmm. and I've got, a, uh, I've got about uh, 50 responses back, but one of the questions we asked was, what's the greatest challenge that you face right now? And you give them a host of options. Is it competition from China? Competition from a startup? Is it uh, uh, getting, you know, attracting the best people? Number one challenge is speed of change. Speed of innovation. Dealing with the speed of innovation. Yep. And, and you know, for a lot of people, that's, that's scary stuff. I mean, a lot of people don't like change. I think organizations, they're built for self-perpetuation. Yes. They resist change. Yes. Uh, so how do you create a culture that embraces change when all the human and organizational DNA that you're dealing with is pulling in the opposite direction? You know, it's a great question. I'm going to use an example that I used 20 years ago, and I was thinking about it last night, how applicable it is today. I'm going to go off the stage for just a second. How many of you in You'll this room... You'll come back, won't you? I will. <laughs> <laughs> how many of you in this room like change? Love change. You love change. Are you married? <laughs> 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 Seven years. Do you ever think about changing that guy? I do think about that every day. She thinks about it. She is turning red. She's uncomfortable. And the point that I'm making, here's the person in life she trusts the most. And merely teasing about change makes her uncomfortable. Change makes Alan uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable. And you've got to get that issue out on the table. And by not talking about it, it's like an elephant in the room. And then you've got to build a culture that understands Change, unfortunately, is going to go exponential. And this digitization is going to create a lot of jobs and it's going to destroy a lot of jobs. 40 to 50% of the companies in this room won't be here in a decade. Will not be here in a decade. When I first started saying that and said it to GM and Ford and Toyota, they looked at me like, you're wrong, John. People now understand that. You've got to build that into your culture. And part of that is an open communication where I would give $100 10 years ago or 20 years ago to any inappropriate question because I wanted people to be able to ask the really tough questions. Of course, I was the judge of whether it was an inappropriate question. I didn't lose any <laughs> dollars. But, but it's how you tell these war stories. It's how you teach culture by example of what works and doesn't and get people relaxed about talking about it and then dealing with the very fun and tremendously positive changes that can occur, but be realistic on the negative ones. Well, and not everybody makes it over the hump. I mean, I recall you Most telling me, I recall you telling me you've turned over 40% of your top leadership in the last couple of years. We've done that, but unfortunately, even when I first came to Cisco, uh, and it was a, a very good startup, uh, 400 people, 70 million in sales, and I looked at the senior leadership team, and I didn't share this with anybody, but I only wanted to keep one of the 13 leaders. And how you change that becomes key. We've had seven CFOs. Did, did you do that? You turned over 12 of 13? 12 of 13. That's hard. It is very hard. But what is even more interesting is that because of our growth, and it's just hard to explain to people in this room until you've experienced it, 65% compounded growth means you double your head count every 18 months for a decade. We created 10 thousand millionaires among our employees, 10,000. Hasn't been done before, probably unfortunately won't be done since. The ability to manage that change and to evolve and being critical of myself, I probably should have put in place early on somebody like Fran on my wing on HR to develop the culture which would allow us to retrain our leaders so they could evolve to the next level. Now having said that, we held talent like no one else. In the industry that averages turnover in Silicon Valley in the mid-teens, especially among the leaders who everybody targets, our annual attrition, voluntary attrition for those 20 years our CEO, probably only averaged 5%. Wow. And uh, the ability to keep that talent. Acquired companies, and when you acquire a company in high tech, you're only acquiring people, 
and next generation products, if you lose the people, you're in trouble. Fran, I think it ran 45% for our 180 average. But how, how do you know if, the, if someone is... 45%, not 45 How do you know if some? I want to talk about acquisitions in a minute, but how do you know if someone is someone who can make the new journey or can't? You have to make that decision quickly, right? Well, I, I think you make a mistake of a leader if you make the decision too quickly. Uh, for your own employees, you, if, if you're doing your job, you're watching your Cisco family, you're watching how they evolve, you watch how they handle stress. Uh, if they aren't under stress, I would deliberately put them under stress because mm -hmm. you learn more about a person under stress than anybody, any time, uh, and you have time to watch them. It's different when you do an acquisition. When you do an acquisition, we've got to make a decision, is this the right company? Uh, interesting enough, culture is one of the five elements that must be very similar to ours or we don't do it. I actually make that decision in the first 15 minutes I talk with the CEO. You can just wow. do it. But you know what questions to ask. You, t you see what's in their office or in their cube. You see what's important to them. You see if they talk about customers. You see if they talk about their employees. Did they share the success of the company with the employees? Do they keep it all at the top? It's not that hard if you know what to word look for, how to connect the dots. You have made hundreds of acquisitions in the 20 years you've been CEO. 180 and Chuck's done 14 since then. 180 and 14, 194. You have to have made some mistakes along the way. Oh yes. Now this will shock you in this room. We, we, we criticized them moving too fast. You know almost every mistake I've made, moving too slow. Really? Yeah. Or equally as bad, I used to consider process a dirty word. It's bureaucracy. Any fast moving startup will tell you, Oh, process, you know, what are you thinking? That's going to slow us down. You can't have speed without a replicatable process. And at that replicatable process, which we do again, think of them as playbooks, it is your replicatable process for how you develop your vision and strategy, the replicatable process for how you develop, retain, uh, recruit, and change your leadership team, your replicatable process for communications, and your replicatable process for culture. And without that, with the speed we're now moving, things come apart. And decisions, to your earlier point, will be made much further down in the organization at a fast pace, and yet the leader, she or he, has to be able to keep their finger on the pulse at the top without those playbooks in place, without that culture in place, without that, unfortunately, process it doesn't work. Well, talk about that replicatable process for culture, because yes. you bring in, I mean, companies, even start, even startups, even small companies can have very strong cultures. Yes. You bring in one of those and you have a replicatable process for m melding that culture with the firm culture. I mean, most, most mergers fail because of culture class. Yes, they do. So what does that process Especially look like? Especially in high tech. Ninety percent of them in high tech I would say fail if you measure success by did you keep the engineering talent, did you get the next generation product out, did you gain market share, was it a good decision for your, your shareholders. So the replicatable process on uh, acquisitions is realize that if you do it the same way everybody else has been doing it, you're going to fail. So it starts with do you have alignment on strategy and vision and if you don't, no matter how good the company is you're acquiring, don't touch it. Culture to me is second. If the culture is dramatically different, we don't touch it. And it takes 15 minutes, 10 minutes with the CEO to really see if well, well, customer... give, me, give us some examples. Like what are some signals that this isn't gonna work? Uh, quick signals is if, if, if they really don't know who their best people are, they need to retain. If they really can't finish my sentences on their top key customers. Huh. Uh, if they talk about how they share the success with their company. If they don't talk about what is their culture, which is about the fourth question I ask them yeah. uh, on it. And we don't acquire a company that has a dramatically different culture. Part of the reason they're successful is we don't touch one that has different. And you have to have the courage that in the evaluation, either in the initial concept between the CEOs or in the business development, that if you find a cultural breach, you leave. We walk from two of our best financial deals uh, that were very good decisions. One, because of a cultural breach on not telling us that some, they'd been uh, post-dating some stock options, a mistake, inappropriate, et cetera. If they just told me, oh, I would have taken it straight to government and fixed it. But because they didn't tell us, when we found out, we walked from the deal. That's a problem. Yeah. Uh, another one, we, we had the financial deal. We were uh, in the Northeast. Uh, we'd flown in. We were having our teams meet. and. Uh, uh, the market had been made aware that we were probably going to acquire them and their stock was going up. And uh, they said, no, uh, that didn't happen. And I knew it had happened, so it was an insult twice. They knew it had happened and it probably come from one of the top people. 
we pulled our team aside, met for five minutes, and we walked. And so you've got to constantly walk the talk of the culture. Uh, even today, Fran will tell you, I still listen to every critical illness in the company, and I will personally get involved with them. I follow our young men and women serving in the services as they go on tours. When a young uh, girl has a 10-month, 10 10-week-old 10 baby that is dying, we move heaven and earth to get her and her child to the right hospital and talk literally to the top doctors and then the people in the hospital to make sure we get the best care. We walk that talk every moment. I, during my 20 years as CEO, uh, probably out of my top 100 people, and that changes over time, as you could imagine, I might have lost one handful of people that it wasn't the right time to leave. People stay at a company. They want the vision and strategy, but they stay because of culture and their management. And that's so important for all of us to understand in this room. If you leave with nothing else, it, it is the combination of strategy and vision with the leadership team, with communication, with culture. The culture, in my opinion, is the foundation for great companies and survival in this world where most companies were not You survive. know, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, I think it was Reed Hoffman who wrote a book about sort of the end of loyalty, that we live in a, a workforce where people's connections to the companies they work for is transient. They may not stay there that long. A lot of people say millennials are more like this than the rest of us. I'm not a millennial. Um, <laughs> you didn't have to laugh. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, I mean, do you find that? Do you think we're in a, in a sort of an Uberized workforce where people are going to come and go and not have the loyalty to the companies they work for that they once did? Yes, I do, unfortunately. Uh, I think if you, you think about the term that you started with, you're not a millennial, I would argue to lead, you have to think like a millennial. Shimon Perez, and I miss him so much, he taught me that. Every time we were together for 17 years, he'd teach me something about leadership. But he said, John, you've got to constantly think like a teenager. You've got to have no fear. You've got to realize it's always darkest, just before victory, but be sure it's victory around the corner, not defeat. And so the first thing is you start thinking, being realistic, how young people think, and you think exponentially, not like we were trained in school to think linearly. Linear thinking, continuing to do the right thing again and again, is the definition of failure. Then within that, you have to realize that the majority of young people coming out of school today, we talk about being on five or six or seven jobs during their life, I think it's gonna be closer to 10. And the reason will be that the companies will turn over, as I said before, at a probably two to three times the pace of what we've seen before. So by definition, a lot of people are affected there. But the companies will not develop the culture that holds this talent and attracts this talent. It is the ability to become a great place to work and to create that environment that holds people in that when your competitors call on your people, they don't return the phone call. Hmm. If they really believe in the company, believe they really make a difference, changing the world, truly a family, really caring, then that's what will determine the future success of companies. But yes, the average person in this room will probably move five to seven times. Your kids will probably move closer to 10. Great companies will maintain and create talent like no one else. You want them to stay. You, you want, want them, them to, to stay. Yeah. It takes you, think about it. If you lose a good person, let's assume you're paying them $200,000 a year. It takes your recruiting fee of $50,000 in time to re-recruit. It spends 200000 retraining the person, and it takes you a couple years to get them back to where they are. Yeah. It's a terrible business decision when you lose a good person, but it also just is not right for the culture. You want to value every person in your company, really care for them. If your company doesn't care about you, think about how you get your CEO to really understand the importance of culture. It starts with you haven't got a great lead of culture or human resources, get somebody like Fran. Secondly, if I can ever help by giving the CEO a call, I will do it. Third, Wait, can, you, can we just stop there for a minute? Yeah. He means that. Oh, I really mean he it. He really don't means don't mean that. It. He will do it. So if, yeah. you, you know, if you have a CEO who you think needs a call, I will do it. And we'll get make the call anonymous on who suggested it. <laughs> but then if the CEO, the CEO doesn't listen, give Fran your resume. We want the best talent. <laughs> Sorry, so, Fran. I'm yeah. a, <laughs> so so talk, talk for a minute. You talked about how you evaluate yeah. acquisitions. Yeah. Talk, for, talk about how you evaluate people. 
Uh, like, what's the, I mean, do you have a question, a favorite question that you like to ask anyone you're considering bringing on the team? Yeah, I, I'm dyslexic, and that gives you a little bit how I think. I, I tend to connect dots. I go A, B, Z pretty accurately, and you have to because of dyslexics cannot think linearly. I mean, uh, most dyslexics are, are pretty effective, but you have to learn to think about it in terms of the outcome differently than before. And, but what I do is I gather data constantly. And so by the time I walk into a company or a person's office, I've already scanned. I see what the receptionist was like, what he or she, how they communicated. I watch the atmosphere as you walk through the area. I look at what is important to the person I'm talking to around them. I'm always well prepared. We are very spontaneous at Cisco, and the reason we're very spontaneous is we're the best prepared people in every meeting. Yeah. Uh, we know what questions to ask, and it, it doesn't take 10 minutes, depending on what they say or how they get it, and you know where they're going to go. And you also can very quickly figure out who you can trust, who you want to acquire, who you can learn from. I think you learn from everyone. Everybody in life's equal, nobody's above or below. But you also, as you do this, we, one thing to understand about Cisco, we have no fear. We actually believe we're unbeatable. Uh, and that's how our sales force thinks. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't be beat, and it doesn't mean we don't make mistakes, and it doesn't mean I, as a leader, didn't make a lot of mistakes I did. And you learn more from your mistakes than your successes. But it is the culture you build, the mentality. One of the top CEOs of one of my competitors said two things to us. He said, John, I want to congratulate you for how you've reinvented Cisco's culture five or six times and the company. And I said, that's why you've got to be a CEO for more than five years. He said, now we're going to disagree again. He said, most people cannot reinvent themselves. You as a company have done that, and it's your culture. Our sales force, when they're told they've lost a deal, they consider it a minor objection. Our competitors pack up their bags and go home. That's culture. And it is the ability to, you'll never see a great company without a great culture. You may or may not like the culture at Microsoft or at a Cisco or at a Bank of America or Walmart, but they all have tremendously strong if, cultures. And if you were going to define the culture at Cisco in one sentence or a few words. Clearly, adapting to change is a big part of it. I would. I, I would probably put it in a couple of elements. I think our, our basic philosophy of changing the world has not changed in 20 years, except it's now a digital world, which we said 15 years ago was going to happen. It's about making innovation happen. It's truly about uh, treating others with respect. Uh, it's about how do you just do the right thing embedded in your culture. And it's about the ability to do great things with no fear. And then articulate it in a way your employees get it. The concept of connect everything, the concept of innovate everywhere, the concepts of everyone benefits. And then saying this is how it drives it through. And it starts with the CEO, with the great HR lead. It is something that your leaders have to go through and is the foundation for you. One, one last question, sure. and then uh, Michael is going to uh, kick us off. Okay. Uh, but, but you talked about data, the importance of data. You talked about the 500 billion connected devices, which in are going to bring in enormous amounts of data. How is that going to change the job of the chief human resources officer or the, officer, or the culture officer? Can data make the, can you run a, uh, uh, run a machine learning algorithm that will tell you who to hire and who not to hire? Probably. I just want to make get everybody in this room uncomfortable. So these, so these the folks, this will be a very small conference very small 10 conference years from now. Years <laughs> but often when you want to make a point, which Alan's given me clearly the opportunity to do, you want to get your attention first. It speaks to, as this world goes digital, your jobs will transform tremendously. 30% of the average professional's job will disappear. And out of the manual jobs, probably closer to 70, 80% will disappear. If we don't retrain America's workforce, if we don't change the K-12 system to teach entrepreneurship and technology, if you don't retrain the people in your organizations for this change, even if your vision and strategy is right and your culture is right, it won't occur. So my challenge to each of you is not a question of will this happen. It is upon us. The U.S. was the last one to really understand digitization as a country. Europe was way ahead of us. Prime Minister Modi in India gets it. They're changing their education systems. They're changing their practices. There is no entitlement here. But for those of you who will be here 10 years from now, and I'll bet you the room is three to four times larger, the roles that you do will be dramatically different. And if you don't make that change yourself, even though change will make you uncomfortable, 
If you don't, especially if you're in the leader of culture, you're the CEO, if you don't take this as one of your top priorities and drive it through, you won't be here then. And it's a period you either disrupt or you get disrupted. John Chambers, always fascinating to talk with you. You make my job easy. Alan, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.